implementation of this new act. Um, there's, I'm sure you will have lots of questions. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of things that are yet to be seen as to how it's going to work in practice, um, sort of based on experience from the system in England and the Children and Families Act. Um, it's it's likely that you know there will be teething problems um, and you know we can anticipate them as much as possible but really um, these things will, will start to come out in the wash as we start to see um, the transition take place so um, so as Kate said I'm a solicitor at Owen Mitchell um, I work in the public law and human rights team and I specialize in, in education law um, so I act for both Welsh and English clients um, so in terms of what we'll cover today, um, I'm just going to start off with sort of very, I'm going to be brief because I'm sure, you, you know, a number of you are aware of the current system, um, have had some involvement in it um, potentially, um, but to give you a bit of a background and overview of the education system in Wales, um, also a, a sort of brief introduction, introduction to how the system is currently, um, and then more importantly, to focus on, on the uh, Additional Learning Needs and Education Tribunal Wales Act and the new system that's coming into, um, that has you know recently started to come into force. And if possible, if there's time, although there is a significant amount to get through, um, to have, take a couple of questions at the end. Um, just to say on this as well, I think the, if I was to cover everything, this seminar would take probably a day. Um, the the code of practice for the new act is it, it comes to over 380 pages. So there is, is a lot there. And what I've tried to do is, is sort of pick out the key information and signpost. Um, so, so that's how I sort of hope to go through things today. So in terms of um, just, just moving on slides there, if um, in relation to education law in Wales, um, education is a, it's a devolved matter under the Government of Wales Act 2006, which means that um, the Welsh Government has um, responsibility for creating laws in relation to education in Wales as opposed to Westminster. Um, and Wales continued to apply the Education Act 1996 after the Children and Families Act came in, in England in 2014. Um, and obviously it's now you know, 25 years old. Um, it's uh, the, the sort of impetus for the change is that um, it, it can be quite complicated, it can be quite convoluted, there are sort of different ways, if there are different bodies with different responsibilities. Um, and it, it, you know, it's intended now to sort of bring everything together, or that's at least the hope. And there is still other relevant uh, legislation which I've just um, highlighted uh, there. So um, in relation to transport, which um, I may touch upon, but won't go into in too much detail today, there's the Learner Travel Wales measure uh, 2008, um, which will continue to apply. Um, there's also the Equality Act, which is, is relevant to, to discrimination. Um, and I've just picked out the, the current Special Educational Needs Code of Practice for Wales there. Um, and the Special Educational Needs Tribunal, as it currently is, must have regard to it and needs to give reasons if it seeks to depart from that guidance. Um, so under the Education Act, so in terms of the definitions, as I say, I won't spend too much time on this, um, but it just gives you the context for, for the changes that are, that are coming in. So um, special educational needs in section 312 of the Education Act, it, it means a child in the area of the local authority in Wales. Um, they have special educational needs, they have a learning difficulty which calls for special educational provision to be made. Um, and they have a learning difficulty if they have a significantly greater difficulty in learning than the majority of children of their age, or they have a disability which prevents or, or hinders them from making use of educational facilities that are, of a kind that are usually um, provided for children of their age within schools within that local authority's area. Um, and if they're under compulsory school age, it would be whether they meet that test if, um, if they um, were of that age. Um, so this is focused on what facilities um, you know, are available within the local authorities area. So there's potential for, for differences between different local authority areas um, and the, the, the educational facilities that are available in those areas. Um, and special education and provision. So when we're looking at, um, at whether they have a learning difficulty which calls for special education provision to be made, um, that means in relation to a child who's two or over, uh, provision which is additional to or otherwise uh, different from the education provision generally made for children of their age in, in schools maintained by the local authority. Um, for children under uh, that age, it's, it's education provision of any kind whatsoever. 
Um, so currently there's this, this three-tier graduated system. So um, school action plus, uh, sorry, school action um, for children who, who have these additional needs where a class teacher or, or SENCO identifies a child with special educational needs. And they should provide these additional interventions within the classroom to, uh, that are additional to or different from those provided as part of the usual curriculum. Um, and those strategies are then recorded in an individual education plan. Um, school Action Plus is a step up from that, um, so a child continues to experience the difficulties despite that programme of support. Um, they may request uh, support from external agencies um, and the, the SENCO will sort of work with those agencies um, and the teachers in consultation with parents to review the IEP um, and to produce a sort of revised IEP with that specialist input. Um, and then if you know that child's still not not making um, the progress expected then um, then you know you may look to a request for a statutory assessment and a, a statement of special educational needs which which I'll come on to um, so when's a statement required currently um, so it's if the local authority believes the the child probably has special educational needs um, and that the uh, it needs or probably needs to determine the special educational provision by making a statement. Um, it will do that where it considers that um, the, the, the special education provision necessary to meet the child's needs can't reasonably be provided um, within the resources normally available to mainstream maintain schools in that area. Um, so that's where we are currently. And at the moment, statements will cease automatically if the child leaves school at 16. Um, if they stay in school, they can maintain until they're 19 or the end of that school year. But that's, you know, that's about to change. So um, I'll come on to that. Um, let me just check. Are you managing to to keep up with me in terms of slides? Sorry, I've, I've yeah, probably yeah. been. No, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. Great. Sorry, I've just probably been going along without telling you where I am. No, um, brilliant. So, um, so yeah, the, in terms of the um, parental right of appeal to the Special Educational Needs Tribunal, um, if the, uh, the local authority refuses to um, do a statutory assessment, if they refuse to issue a statement, um, they, parents can appeal contents of part two, parts two to four of the statement, um, and they can also appeal a decision um, that the local authority takes to cease to maintain the statement. They've got two months um, to make that appeal. And that would be in the Special Educational Needs Tribunal for Wales, or CENTU, as it's sometimes known. Um, there is currently, uh, it, it's being renamed, but there is currently these two systems um, running in parallel. So what, what I'll come on to is there's actually two websites one for sent to as it was known and um one for the educational tribunal for wales as it will be known going forward um and so um you know knowing where you are in which system you fall into will depend on you know which which website you, you access if you are looking to appeal um, and i'll put those links later on in the slides um, so statements, just a, a broad overview of what they cover, so how they're set out. So the, the key sections are really the special educational needs in part two, the special education provision in part three, um, placement in part four, um, and then it goes on to non-educational um, needs and provision. Um, it will change. The, the new, um, new uh, individual development plans do look very different. They look, um, they have parts um, and sections and we shall see but it, it you know i'm hoping that it won't become too confusing but i from what i've seen so far it feels like it may have the potential to um but i'll do my best to you know explain how it, it's supposed to work in practice um okay so moving on to the next slide then so um currently post 16 education is dealt with separately as i said so the duty to secure education and training for young people in post-16 education actually rests with the welsh ministers instead of local authorities under the learning and skills act um, and that can create a bit of a lack of, you know there can be a lack of a joined up approach then when children uh, young people are transitioning into post-16 education particularly those with, with special educational needs um, and careers wales can provide independent advice in relation to, to people with special educational needs um, on post-16 options and, and and potentially undertaking assessments of, of needs under section 140 of the learning skills act um, and and looking at specialist post-16 placements but the idea of the new act is that you know these children, these young people will will come under um, an individual development plan, which could potentially remain in place until they're they're twenty five. 
Okay, so now looking at the additional learning needs and education tribunal wells act. So it passed, it was passed by Parliament uh, in January 2018. Um, so it's been it's been a you know quite a long time coming. Um, and the idea is that it will be a, a phased implementation from the 1st of September, just passed um, over three years. So there'll be two systems effectively running in parallel uh, until 2024. Now, as I said before, we know from the Children and Families Act that actually the best laid plans, um, you know, don't always come to fruition. And actually, we saw it took quite a lot longer to get children transfer from statements to EHCPs in England. I suspect we may see something similar here. Um, but unhelpfully, and I really hoped to, today that we would have the implementation guides because they were promised in the mid-autumn term. Um, and I emailed the Welsh Government, I think on Monday, to check where they were. And they told me that they, they are being published this week, but we don't have them yet. I checked this morning. Um, so if I'd had that, I was hoping to go through and quickly digest everything and, and give you a bit of a brief summary. I don't have them. Um, and so the, the, um, the position in relation to implementation remains somewhat unclear. Um, my advice is to, to look out for those. Um, and, and when they come out, those are hopefully going to be sort of your best bet in terms of knowing how and when your children will, will be transitioning to the new system um, and hope I'm hoping that they'll be very sort of helpful because they're, they're going to have one specifically for parents um, so so watch the space hopefully they will come out you know they may come out whilst we're having this this training session who knows um, but that's where we are as I said the rationale for change is that the current system's not really fit for purpose anymore it's you know it's bewildering and adversarial families feel like they have to you know battle at each and every stage and and I mean I'm hopeful that this will change things I do have some concerns which I will highlight um but in theory it is designed to sort of yes bring it all together under one plan and for children who have special educational needs or additional learning needs um so in relation to um the the act the the airline code uh, for Wales uh, came, it was approved by the Senate in March this year, came into force on the 1st of September. So I put the link there to that. Um, that's probably a go-to document, really. It's, it's, as I said, it's extremely long, um, but it does sort of helpfully break it down into different sections, depending on what age your child is, you know, wh what type of school they attend. Um, and then um, that's, that's probably the best best document for you to look at. Um, the most recent statement we have from the Welsh Government, so um, that was from Jeremy, Jeremy Miles in, in, on the 14th of July this year, that said the implementation of the ALN system for the first year will be sequenced, children who are newly identified as having additional learning needs, so that's those without already identified special educational needs, so without um, School Action, School Action Plus, or are not awaiting or undergoing a special educational needs assessment already will still move to the new ALN system from the 1st of September. However, for those children who attend a, a maintained school, including a people referral unit, and who already have that identified special educational need um, through School Action or School Action Plus, then the new system would apply from the 1st of January next year. Um, and he said that he expects the, the sector to use that period to reflect on the guidance, begin preparing um, and engaging those who, who already have identified uh, SCN in School Action and School Action Plus with their transition to the arrangement. So things should start to be happening in terms of preparing for that. Um, the intentions that eventually they will take over from existing learning support plans, so statements, IEPs um, and learning and skills plans will all become IDPs. Um, but as I said, it sounds quite complicated. I think it will take longer than they think it will. Um, and we just sort of need to watch the space for the implementation guides to, to see where we are. Um, so in terms of 1st of September, it applies to all children newly identified as having ALN, um, and that's sort of in any setting. Um, it doesn't include those children who have a statement or school action, um, or school action plus, or, or um, you know, the equivalent early years action or early years action plus. Um, and if those children are already engaged with the statement process, so if they started doing the SEN assessment, 
process they're not they're not considered to be new to the ALN system um I do think the position in relation to implementation is slightly unclear I have looked and the the, com the commencement orders which are the orders that were were due to bring in the provisions in relation to children with school action and school action plus were evoked in August and we haven't had a statement from the, the Welsh government since updating on that. Um, so a further update is waited. We need to see what these implementation guides say. Um, and I'm sorry that can't be more helpful as to how, you know, how this is going to work in, in terms of the, the transition immediately. What I can do is tell you how it's supposed to work in practice um, and how, you know, what you should be looking for and, and the steps that schools and further education institutions and local authorities should be taking and I'll, I'll come on to this as well um so in terms of the code as i said that's your go-to document it is a color-coded system so it's got this must which is is the color codes are in the in the code um a must is a requirement in the legislation or code to do something so that's a that's an enforceable duty um must not again prohibited in law for doing something so if they do don't if they do something that they're prohibited from doing that's unlawful um may means that they can do it but they don't have to um and should or should not means that they they should be doing it they they should be following it unless they can demonstrate there's good reasons for not following it um and so usually that would be sort of they would have to demonstrate those those circumstances that, that justify that Okay, so coming on to um, the definitions in the um, the new act. So uh, the term special educational needs is is replaced with the term additional learning needs. Um, and section two of the act says that a child has ALN if he or she has a learning difficulty or disability, uh, whether that arises from a medical condition or otherwise, which I think is important, which calls for additional learning provision. Um, and the code summarises the test for ALN for children of compulsory school age as um, whether they have a learning difficulty, and that's a significantly greater difficulty in learning than the majority of others of the same age, or do they have a disability which prevents or hinders them from making use of facilities for education um, or training, which is generally provided for others of the same age in, in mainstream maintained schools or further education institutions. And if so, does that learning difficulty or disability call for additional learning provision? Um, and in terms of the definition um, of additional learning provision, I'll come on to that. There is a helpful glossary in chapter one of the code of um, the ALN code. Um, and chapter 20 uh, contains guidance on identifying ALN and, and, and deciding upon ALP. So that's that's a good place to look. Um, and the definition of additional learning provision. So ALP is, is educational or training provision additional to or different from that generally made for others of the same age in mainstream maintained schools in Wales, uh, further education, uh, mainstream further education institutions or, or nursery um, nurseries in Wales. So um, that's, that's the test and that's helpful because you're comparing it across the whole of Wales. Um, and if so, First of all, does the child have a learning difficulty or a disability which prevents or hinders them from making use of those facilities generally provided for others in mainstream maintained schools? And this calls for additional learning provision, i.e. Um, they need that, that educational training provision, which is different from or over and above that generally made in, uh, in mainstream maintained schools in Wales, then they have ALN for the purposes of this act. Um, and if they have ALN, um, an IDP should be made for them. So in terms of identifying ALN, as I said, chapter 20 of the code has some helpful information on this. I've just picked out some sort of key points. So evidence can come from various places. It can come from staff, other services involved with the child, parents or the young person. Where there's an identified disability, the evidence will relate to what that disability prevents or hinders the child from doing excuse me, um, in terms of making use of those facilities usually provided, um, and likely that will involve advice from specialists involved with that individual. Where the child doesn't have an identified disability, it's really likely to be um, observing and assessing their progress through things like screening assessments, 
um, questionnaires, personalized assessments, um, that sort of thing. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I've just got over a cold, so I'm losing my voice slightly. Um, so, and the other thing to note is that slow progress um, <clears throat> and low attainment don't necessarily mean uh, that they have ALN and it doesn't automatically lead to a decision that they have ALN. But where that progress continues to be less than expected, um, and there's been sort of differentiated approaches that haven't addressed that attainment gap, that would usually indicate that the child may have ALM. Um, and then there are these requirements to consider, or, and it's on local authorities, not schools, to consider seeking advice from an educational psychologist. And there are circumstances where they must seek an advice um, from an educational psychologist. Um, and I'll come on to that as well. OK, so the next slide. So um, this is just another helpful bit in terms of identifying um, ALN. It's about um, identifying the learners making less than expected progress. Um, so progress significantly slower than that of their peers which fails to match or better their previous rate of progress, which fails to close or widen the attainment gap um, between them and their peers, despite the provision of support. Um, so in terms of, of those are the definitions, in terms of other key changes, um, so as I said, um, School Action, School Action Plus, uh, Early as Action, and early as action Plus um, and statements will be replaced by an individual development plan um everyone who meets that definition and has additional learning needs in wales will get an idp that's the aim um and you can have an idp up to the age of 25 um, unless a, a decision is taken to cease to maintain you know which is, is the same as the position with ehcps in england <coughs> you'll be pleased to know that there is an enhanced focus on participation of the child parent and young person um so the any person exercising functions under this act, so for the school, the governing body, the local authority, must have regard to the views, wishes and feelings of the child and the child's parent or young person, and the importance of the child and the child's parent or the young person participating as fully as possible in decisions. So that's helpful. Um, there's this new ALN co-role um, for maintained uh, mainstream schools and further education institutions, and they're responsible for coordinating provision of learners with ALN. Um, and I'd come on to that on the next slide here. So this is addressed in chapter eight of the new code. All mainstream maintained schools and further education institutions in Wales must designate a personal person who will have responsibility for coordinating uh, learners with ALN. And this is the ALN Co. Um, I've just set out there some of the um, responsibilities of the ALN, ALN Co. Um, it's a statutory role which effectively replaces the existing non-statutory SENCO role that exists in most maintained schools um, and similar non-statutory roles in further education institutions. Um, so um in terms of qualifications they must be a school teacher or a further education teacher and, and, and unless they were senko before january this year because these statutory roles came in in january this year mm. um and every local authority must designate an early years aln co as well for children under compulsory school age who aren't main, uh, attending maintained schools um so the next slide then so in terms of routes to the idp i think this is where it can become quite complicated um and I've done my best to break it down for you. It is set out in the act and in the code. As I say, the best thing um, to do is to check which section your child falls under in terms of what school they attend and, and whether they're of compulsory school age or, or below. And then look at that section because I can't cover off the circumstances for everyone because it, it does get quite complicated. But broadly, either the school, the further education institution or the local authority can prepare the IDP. So this is different to the situation in England, where it's the, the local authority's uh, responsibility to prepare an EHCP. But it appears that the intention is because this will cover all children with ALN, um, including those who would have previously fallen under school action, school action plus, that actually the, the less complex um, plans will be able to be maintained by the schools. And then if it, if it needs if the child needs sort of more complex provision or over and above what the school can be reasonably expected 
to provide, um, then the local authority will get involved. Um, but the code does say that maintained schools have a key role to play in identifying ALN and delivering ALP. Uh, they're directly responsible for identifying and meeting the needs of the majority of their pupils with ALN. So that's, that's the expectation. Uh, the local authority will get involved where it's brought to their attention or otherwise appears to them that the child may have ALN or where they're asked to reconsider the school's decision because there will effectively be a right to to ask that the local authority steps in if, if you're unhappy with with the decision taken by the school and then the local authority's decision could be appealable to the tribunal so it becomes it kind of adds in an additional step and and we'll see i feel that there is potential for it to become quite complicated and, and for there to be disputes between schools, local authorities, and I'm, I'm interested to see how that plays out. Um, hopefully it won't, you know, impact things on the ground, um, but I do have my concerns. Um, so the first route to an IDP um, on the next slide. So where it is brought to maintain school's attention or otherwise appears that a child may have ALN, so that's may, they must then make a decision, and that's must, if they do have ALN unless there's already an IDP being maintained, the school has previously decided the issue and, and there's been no material change, uh, child's dual registered at two schools and the local authority is responsible for the child, in which case the local authority uh, must make that decision um, or they have an EHCP because a local authority in England maintains it for them. Um, so when it's brought to their attention and it has to make that decision, decision the school must designate someone responsible for that decision um that may be the ALN code but not necessarily uh, record the date it was brought to its attention or appeared that the child may have ALN record a summary of how it was brought to their attention or appeared to them um notify the child and parent that they're making that decision and and consider an initial meeting with the child and parent um this applies to maintained schools, independent schools and independent specialist post-16 institutions are not required to have regard to the code um, and its requirements as it will be the local authority respons um, responsibility to maintain the statement, um, sorry, the IDP for children at those schools. Um, and the possibility that a child has ALN might be brought to the attention of the school by parent, child, family member, other professional, it doesn't really matter. Once a school become aware that a child may have ALN, they must then make that decision. And um, in its most basic form, they're then responsible for assessing and preparing and maintaining the IDP. Um, although there, there are some uh, exceptions which I'll come on to. Um, so if a decision is taken by the school that the child doesn't have ALN, it must notify the child and their parent within 35 school days of it being brought to their attention or appearing to them that the child may have ALN. That feels like quite a short time frame to me because the local authority has a lot longer um, and I think that is supposed to reflect the, the fact that it's you know um, because this this also applies if they are going to make um, an IDP they still only have 35 school days I'll come on to that on the next slide but I think that's to reflect that it's it's really going to be sort of the less complex cases where the school is is um, preparing and maintaining the IDP um, and so it, it's really just deciding what supports required and, and getting that put into a plan it may just be that for children with with school action or school action plus the same provision is just formalized into a plan um so in terms of the next slide if the school decides a child has ALN it must prepare an IDP um unless it would not be reasonable for the school to secure the ALP the child requires um the school can't adequately determine the extent uh, or nature of the child's additional learning needs, or it can't adequately determine the additional learning provision. Um, so as I say, I think this is where it, the slight, you know, in the more complex cases, um, it, it may then be for the local authority to prepare the IDP instead of the school, um, in which case the school will then refer to the local authority, which it should usually do within it 20 school days of it, of realising that the child may have ALM. Um, and there are other circumstances um, where if the, if the child's under the English system, um, the, the school doesn't need to prepare an IDP. Um, <clears throat> so if the school decides that the child does have ALN, they must make that decision, prepare the IDP and give a copy of it promptly and in any event before the end of 35 school days from it being brought to their attention or appearing to the school that the child may have ALN. Um, and 
there is this exception, which is unless it's impractical to do so uh, due to circumstances beyond its control. Um, this will be interesting to see what, what comes of this because um, it's not sort of entirely clear. There is some guidance in the act um, about when it may be used, but it doesn't appear to be sort of a, um, sorry, I say that in the act, I mean in the code, um, but it doesn't appear to be um, exhaustive. So I don't want to see sort of local authorities using it, this exception um, regularly, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> so what the code says is that the school should give the child and the child's parent an opportunity to comment on the draft uh, IDP and encourage them to raise concerns ASAP and then should act upon them appropriately. Now, this is a should, it's not a must. That does cause me some concern. We'll see how that plays out because, um, you know, it's not sort of a statutory requirement to, to give that um, that opportunity. Um, and I hope that that's not diluting um, parents' rights. We'll ultimately still have the right to appeal to the tribunal. Um, but at this stage, you know, it'll be interesting to see how um, how that that works in terms of local authorities um, giving that opportunity to to comment on the, the IDP. Um, <clears throat> the school must give contact details for the school, information about how to access local authorities, uh, arrangements for accessing advice and information about ALN, uh, details of dispute resolution and advocacy arrangements, um, and information about the right to request that the local authority reconsiders the plan and takes over responsibility for maintaining it. And that's an important one. That's your right to request that as a parent. Um, and <clears throat> where a maintained school has prepared an IDP, unless that responsibility is transferred to the local authority, as we've discussed, it must maintain it. Um, <clears throat> so it must secure the additional learning provision within it, um, except any which is um, provided by an NHS body, in which case the NHS body must secure it. Um, and if the IDP specifies that particular kind of ALP should be provided in Welsh, then the school uh, or NHS body where um, applicable must take all reasonable steps to secure that it is provided in Welsh. Um, okay. So in relation to referrals from the maintained school to the local authorities, there are two circumstances where they must refer to local authority. That's where a child's dual registered at, at two schools um, or is looked after by the local authority. Um, but they can also refer in other circumstances. They just don't have to. Um, if a child or child's parents request that local authority reconsider the decision made by maintained school, then the local authority must then decide whether or not that child has ALN. As I say, that is your right to request that. Uh, if you're not happy with um, the decision by the school. Um, so the local authority must then notify the child and parent of the decision and reasons within seven weeks of receiving the request for reconsideration. Okay, moving on to the next slide then. So the second route is through the local authority. So where it's brought to a local authority's attention or otherwise appears to the local authority that a child may have ALN, the local authority has to determine if the child has ALN um, unless there's been no material change. Again, there's these steps that they have to take. So designate someone responsible for making that decision, recording the summary of how it's brought to their attention, notifying um, that it's making that decision um, and considering offering the initial meeting. Um, and when deciding whether the child has ALN, the local authority must consider whether to seek advice from an educational psychologist. So at the very least, they must consider it. Um, but if they consider it necessary um, to determine the extent or nature of the ALN or the ALP called for by the ALN, then they must seek advice from an educational psychologist. I think um, that's gonna be sort of a helpful part of the code to draw um, the local authority's attention to effectively if, if you feel that um you know that educational psychology input is necessary in order to determine the ALN or the ALP um <clears throat> so it you know it could be anyone again who brings it to the local authority's attention it could be a health board in Wales could be a child care provider parents might raise concerns through a non-maintained setting directly with the local authority it doesn't really matter again um, but if it is a direct approach by a child or parent or other family member and they're in a maintained, the child's in a maintained school, then it might consider that the matter is better decided by the school and bring it to the school attention instead, thereby triggering the school's duty to consider whether the child has ALN. Um, <clears throat> so this is why I say it can become convoluted. I feel like there is potential for passing the buck 
um, which does concern me slightly. We shall see. I mean, I think the key point to bear in mind is that you have that right to request that the local authority reconsider. I am concerned it will add in delay. Um, the, you know, the Act tries to mitigate against that, but I do think it will add some additional delay. Um, if the local authority decides a child doesn't have ALN, um, it must notify the child and parent of the decision with reasons promptly and in any event within seven weeks if they're reconsidering the school's decision, as we just discussed, but in all other cases uh, within 12 weeks, unless it's impractical to do so due to circumstances beyond its control. Um, and as well as giving that decision and reasons, it must give contact details to the local authority, again, the information about their um, uh, advice services, details of advocacy and resolution um, of disagreement arrangements, and importantly, again, information about the right to appeal to the tribunal. Um, and so, it, yeah, it could potentially be a long-winded process. So the school could, could decide the child doesn't have ALN, parents are asked to reconsider, uh, parents ask the local authority to reconsider, the local authority then considers if the child has ALN, if so, whether it should provide ALP, or whether the school could provide the ALP, if the school should provide it, then the local authority can direct the school to maintain the IDP, so it becomes very circular. Um, and I feel that there is potential for conflict between schools and local authorities, um, which will be interesting, especially maintain, when maintained schools have the same, likely have the same legal advisors. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, <clears throat> and even where um, a local authority decides a child doesn't have ALM, the Act says that, you know, they should outline what action the school and local authority will take to ensure that needs are met nonetheless. Um, if, on the other hand, the local authority decides the child does have ALM, they must prepare an IDP and maintain it, or alternatively, direct the school to prepare and maintain the IDP, as we've just discussed. I and mean, again, it's this should give the child and child's parent an opportunity to comment on the draft and encourage them to raise concerns ASAP. Um, my same, um, so have the same concerns around that. Um, so the local authority must make the decision on ALN, prepare an IDP and give a copy of it promptly in any event before the period of seven weeks if it's reconsidering the school's decision, 12 weeks in all other cases of it being brought to its attention or otherwise appearing to them that the child may have ALN. Um, and again, what they must notify the parent of is detailed there. Um, and again, information importantly about the right to appeal to the tribunal. Um, and, and, and local authorities will maintain an IDP for children and young people who are not pupils at a maintained school or maintain further education institution. Um, they will uh, maintain IDPs for looked after children, children under compulsory school age who aren't at a maintained setting, um, young people in specialist post-16 education um, and children at independent schools as well. So um, in those circumstances, it's really um, the school will only be involved if it's maintained um, mainstream school. And also that applies to nurseries as well. Um, there are the same duties on the local authority to secure the ALP and the IDP. Again, unless it's provided by an NHS body, in which case the NHS body must provide it or if it's transferred that responsibility to the school. Um, and again, the equivalent duty to take all reasonable steps to secure ALP and Welsh if that's in the IDP. Uh, there's also a duty on schools to take all reasonable steps to help the local authority to secure the ALP and the IDP. Um, so, for example, training and developing their staff, um, ensuring there's appropriate equipment involving the child and parent in the process and decisions um, and ensuring that teaching staff are aware of, of the child's ALN and ALP as well. OK, so um, coming on to the next slide, if the, if the child is to be a registered pupil at a maintained school, there are some circumstances where a local authority may instead direct the school about an IDP. So, again, it's this circular thing that we've spoken about. I mean, where a local authority decides that a child has ALN, it may then direct the school to prepare and maintain an IDP. Um, where it's decided a child has ALN, it's then gone on to prepare an IDP. Um, it may, if it considers it appropriate, then direct the school to maintain the IDP, um, where the local authorities revised an IDP um, following a tribunal order, the local authority may then direct the school to maintain the IDP, or where the local authority already maintains an IDP, it could then direct the school to maintain it. Um, but 
this is important, it shouldn't direct the school to prepare an IDP unless it be reasonable for the school to secure the ALP, the school could not adequately determine the extent and nature of the ALM, and the school um, could adequately determine the ALP, as we discussed before. Um, and it must not direct school, as we said, if the child is dual registered or the local authority is required to specify a place at a particular school or other institutional board and lodging in the IDP. So that I think what that's getting at there is, you know, it can't direct a current school that's saying we can't meet needs to maintain the IDP if actually a different school is going to be named in the IDP. Um, because that, you know, that just doesn't make sense. So in that case, it would be the local authority. Um, okay. So where a local authority directs maintain school to prepare and maintain an IDP, the code says that a local authority should do so promptly and sufficiently early within the period within which it otherwise would have been required to prepare and give a copy of the IDP. Um, this is so that school then has that adequate time to prepare it and it doesn't sort of lead to delay. Um, and the periods are the same for the school to prepare the IDP and, and give a copy to a child or parent. So um it's 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 a difficult one i think as i say the code is trying not to add in that delay um i hope we won't see that delay but i do think there will be circumstances where if local authority is reconsidering and then it's passing it back to a school it does have the potential to become quite convoluted um so these are other sort of relevant provisions so ceasing to maintain the governing body of the school the maintained school or local authority can decide to cease to maintain the idp if it decides the child or young person no longer has alm um so again this is shifting a responsibility to the school to make that decision which they won't have been used to um but child and young parent child and parents and young people importantly can request that the local authority reconsiders um, that decision and it has four weeks to do so and then ultimately has a right to appeal to the tribunal um, if they're unhappy with the local authority's decision. Um, IDPs must be reviewed at least annually um, and that's a at least it doesn't mean um, annually it means if there's a reason to do it sooner it should be sooner um, and it, you know, the code says that it should be monitored on an ongoing basis by the body that's responsible for maintaining it and should conduct reviews as often as required. Um, if there's been a significant change in circumstances or new information has come to light, then an earlier review will often be appropriate. Um, if a request to review an IDP is made by the child or parent or young person to the maintained school, uh, further education institution or local authority, uh, it must conduct a review unless it considers a review to be unnecessary. Um, so you can make that request. Um, and as I say, you will have that right to appeal to the tribunal if you're unhappy with the local authority's ultimate decision. Um, and these are, I'm just highlighting these for you because as I say, there's so many different sections of the code and, and different sort of individuals that it applies to. Um, duties in relation to children of compulsory school age who are not registered at a maintained school, that's chapter 13 of the code. It's the duty on the local authority to decide if the child has ALN um, and to prepare and maintain the IDP in that in those circumstances. Uh, duties in relation to young people, so so people over compulsory school age at maintained schools. Um, it's similar, but the young person will be involved um, rather than the parent, and, and they need to seek that young person's consent to the decision being made. Uh, duties in relation to young people at further education institutions, that's chapter 17, and duties in relation to children and young people receiving education otherwise than at school, so um, provision at home. Um, a local authority uh, may only arrange for the additional learning provision described in an IDP or any part of that provision, and that's important, to be made otherwise than in a school, so you know, at home or elsewhere, if it's satisfied that it would be inappropriate for the ALP to be made in a school. Um, and there's um, there's some helpful points on that in, in chapter 18 of the code. Independent schools, as we said, are not required um, by the act to decide whether a child uh, has ALN or to maintain a, an IDP. Um, they are, however, subject to the standards regime for independent schools about the quality of education provision of information. Um, and a local authority deciding whether a child attending an independent school has ALN or preparing an IDP um, for that child should work with the independent school to try and identify the ALN and ALP 
um, and when maintaining an IDP for such a child um, to secure the ALP, the author local authority should work with the school to satisfy itself that it's being delivered. Okay, um, chapter 14 deals with duties in relation to looked after children. Chapter 15 deals with duties in relation to young people at maintained schools. Um, okay, so the contents of an IDP, this is why I was saying that it, it is very different. It's um, It's got sections, it's got sort of subsections, um, it's got sort of to a point something and it, it's not the easiest thing to read, if I'm honest. I haven't yet seen one in practice. I'm just going off the annex to the airline code. Um, and it's Annex A, if you want to have a look at it. Um, but as you will see, it's got sort of these sections and subsections. Um, so 1A is bi biographical information about, about the child or young person. Um, 1B is who's responsible for, for the IDP um, and the review date. One sees the about me section, so um, that's sort of the all about me section. Two um, A is the importantly the description of the additional learning needs, so that's an appealable section, um, and that's um, previously our part two. Two B is the description and delivery of ALP, um, so that includes outcomes, the ALP that's to be provided, and and it's not the whole of this section that's appealable; it's certain bits of it. And again, this is why I think it becomes complicated. Um, so the ALP to be provided, the actual provision, that's appealable. Um, should it be provided in Welsh? Again, that part is appealable. Um, and then there's some other sort of parts in that in relation to um, which um, organisation or service will provide it, the rationale, etc. cetera. Um, 2C is uh, the description and delivery of any ALP to be secured by an NHS body. Most parts of this section will be appealable. Uh, 2D is the um, is the school or institution named, um, and again that is appealable. Um, so that's your um, part four from your statement. Um, and then there's these other um, other parts in relation to um, sort of transition planning, travel arrangements. Um, in relation to travel, uh, the position will still be as it is currently under the Learn and Travel Wales measure. Um, so it won't. Uh, they can, those preparing an IDP can, where relevant, record uh, arrangements for, for travel um, to school. But in many cases, there just won't be an additional benefit of doing that um, because the, the law is as it, as it has been um, and this section is not appealable. OK, coming on to the next slide. Then these were just a couple of points that I picked out um, from the code. So. Section 2A, um, so that's the, the additional learning needs. It says um, the description of the child or young person's ALN should be as clear and comprehensive as possible and include the impact of the need on the child or young person's learning in as much detail as possible. Um, so it says should, it doesn't say must. And that's, that's I mean, it's there's case law around this. So I think in terms of... Um, it's, it's likely that they will still be required to specify and quantify, but, um, and I hope that this doesn't again dilute any rights, um, but these are sort of helpful parts of the code to point to if you, if you are, um, you know, seeking an appeal, um, because it does set out really what they should be doing. Um, section 2B.2, this section should, where relevant, include details of how regularly the ALP is to be provided. Um, for example, daily, weekly, at weekend, school days only, term time only, or once each term. So again, that's getting at like specification, quantification of provision. Um, and that's important. And it, it should be detailed, specific and quantifiable, simply stating that support will be provided, will not meet the need for clarity, describing the tasks any staff will undertake or facilitate, what they'll be responsible for, and if applicable, what qualifications or training they'll require is important. So I think those are some helpful extracts that you may want to rely on in the future. Um, school choice. So uh, there is still a presumption in favour of mainstream schools. Local authorities must name a mainstream maintained school unless one of the following apply. It's incompatible with the provision of efficient education for other children and uh, no reasonable steps could be taken to remove that incompatibility, importantly, because if they can, they should be. 
um, education other than in a mainstream maintained school is appropriate in the child's best interests and compatible with the provision of efficient education for other children or and importantly where the child's parent wishes for the school to, uh, for the child to be educated otherwise than in a, a mainstream maintained school um, so you have that right to to say if you want your child to be educated otherwise than in a mainstream maintained school um, however uh, this does displace the duty to secure mainstream maintained education, but there is no absolute duty to secure that the child is educated in the way that the parents um, want. The, the, I'll, I'll put however, and I'll come on to this. So the local authority's duty to secure that the child is educated in a mainstream maintained school does not apply, so it's displaced, if the parent wishes their child to be educated otherwise than in a mainstream maintained school. However, where this is the case, the local authority is not necessarily required to secure that the child's educated otherwise in a mainstream maintained school, but the local authority must have regard to those wishes and will need to consider the circumstances of, of the case. So it's important, um, but it's not necessarily determinative. Um, a decision not to educate a child in a, in a mainstream setting ought not to be taken lightly in any circumstances, especially if the parent would prefer mainstream schooling. The local authority must have regard to the views, wishes and feelings of the child and the child's parents um, and other relevant factors, including the ability of the mainstream maintained school or any potential alternative setting to offer appropriate ALP. Um, so these factors, together with the views of educational psychologists and other relevant um, specialists, um, should be taken into account. And it's important that all decisions are taken on the basis of the individual circumstances. Um, so this is where if we were you know assisting with a tribunal appeal we would be um you know pointing to all of those additional circumstances um that that mean that 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 school your parental preference is appropriate um and and meets the child's needs uh school choice um for independent schools so for a local authority to describe and secure provision at an independent school in wales it must be on the register of independent schools in wales and the local authority must be satisfied that that school can make the ALP and the IDP. Um, where a child or, or parent would prefer a placement at an independent school, um, but the child's reasonable needs for ALP could be met in a maintained education setting or a um, further education institution. The local authority is not then required to fund the learner's place at that independent school, um, but it should um, explain the situation to the parent and, and the child, um, how their needs could be met without recourse to an independent placement. Um, and of course, you know, that is something that, that you can um, appeal in the tribunal. Um, and there are some, some guide, there's some guidance in the code um, when a local authority is considering whether they should place the child or young person at an independent school. Um, they'll need to consider whether the evidence demonstrates that the ALP required um, is only available in that school. Sorry, um, to in sorry to interrupt, Beth. I think the, the slides are still on contents of the IDP. Oh, sorry. Is that right? Um, no, keep going. Backward, sorry. Uh, sorry, it's, no, it's my fault. I should have. It's still <laughs> on IDP for everybody else, so it might need a refresh. Oh, is oh, it? <laughs> it's frozen. Right, okay, what I'll do is I'll just stop sharing for a second and then I'll reshare. <laughs> Thank you for that. Do say if it's um sorry lagging. Uh, one moment. So it should be on school choice now for everyone. Is that all right? It's I'm not come up screen just yet. Moment. It wouldn't be Zoom without one technical glitch, <laughs> would it? On. Yeah. It's still black. It is. Um, one sec. Can you see my screen yet? It just says that you've started screen sharing. Right, okay. And what um, can you guys see? 
that's all we can see, just a black screen. Right. Um, it, um, it, it, it might be worth, Nicole, you just signing out and coming back in. Okay. okay. Um, and I can, then we can start it again. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. One sec. It's the, uh, the perils of virtual presentations. Apologies, everybody. Hmm. So we'll just wait for Nicole to come back in and then we'll make a co-host again. If anybody would like to, you know, get themselves a, a quick drink or if they need a break, this might be a good time. Although we're coming to the end of the session, but right, okay, I can see Nicole. Let's have a look. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so I'll just try and share my screen again quickly. So we might have missed a few slides because it was stuck on the IDP slide. <clears throat> Okay, which one would you like, um, Bethany? Could, uh, it, it, it would be worth to go back to what's to to what we potentially have missed, just yeah. so for we've got it okay. on the screen. We were on <clears throat> contents of the IDP, weren't we? So it would be school choice, the next one. Okay, there we go, perfect. Um, Yes, so this is the point in relation to um, the mainstream maintained school um, that we spoke about and, and um, when a local authority doesn't need to um, name a mainstream maintained school. Um, and that includes, so basically that, that presumption of favour of mainstream is displaced if the parent or child wishes for the child to be educated other than in mainstream, or it can be, but then there's no absolute duty to secure the provision that the, the, the parents want. Um, but they must have regard to parental wishes. Um, and, you know, it does highlight the importance um, of, of mainstream and, and that a decision um, not to educate in mainstream ought not to be taken lightly in any circumstances. Um, so, okay, if you go on to the next slide. Um, so these were the, the quotes that I read out from the ALN code um, about um, mainstream um, settings. Um, I won't go over it again, but it's just there for you um, to, to peruse. Um, and in relation to, just moving on to the next slide, in relation to independent schools, um, as I said, so um, for the local authority to describe and secure provision in an, in an IDP at an independent school, it must be on the register of independent schools in Wales, um, and the LLA must be satisfied that it can make the additional learning provision in the IDP. Um, so that's, is that where we got up to? Was I going through, um, the, the considerations, um, for a local authority when considering whether to place the child or young person at an independent school? I'll just, um, if you just pause on that slide for a minute, I'll just talk this through. Um, it's not on mm -hmm. the slide, but, um, where it's considering whether they should place the child or young person at an independent school, then they need to consider whether the evidence demonstrates that the ALP, um, is only available in that school um, or the child or young person has medical um, or social care needs that can't be met um, by local providers in a maintained school or further institution a further education institution and that would prevent them from accessing an educational training suitable to meet their needs um, if provision to meet the child or young person's needs could also be secured at another independent school where the placement at that particular independent setting um, would be compatible with the provision of efficient instruction and training um, and the avoidance of unreasonable public expenditure. So these are the sorts of arguments that we expect local authorities to be making um, around, uh, you know, if, if parental preference is, is for an independent school. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so appeals against decisions then. So we touched upon this earlier, but you can appeal against a variety of decisions in the Educational Tribunal for Wales. Um, and there are, as I said earlier, two tribunals running in parallel until the old system stays out. And there are two different websites. Um, if you Google Education Tribunal for Wales, it'll come up. I think I put the websites on the next slide, actually. Um, and 
so it depends where you are if you're still in the statement to process uh, or the sem assessment process then you would still go to send to um if you're in the new system the alm system um then it would be going to the education tribunal for wales and there are guides on the website there are um some helpful obviously there's the application forms um and there's a lot of helpful information on there um for parents if, if you're looking to appeal um so so that's the best place to look for, for that um and and the decisions that can be um appealed as i say there's a there's a lot of them because there's various different sort of stages of the decision um but importantly you can't challenge the school in the tribunal so you have to go through that asking the local authority to reconsider first um and then appealing that decision. Further education institutions, interestingly, can be challenged in the tribunal. So that we knew to them. Um, and it'd be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Um, but if a local authority or further education institution uh, makes a decision as to whether a child or young person has ALN, that decision is appealable. Um, a decision as to whether it's necessary to prepare or maintain an IDP, um, that's uh, a decision which is uh, appealable. The local authority refuse to, refuses to decide a matter because it says there's been no material change or no uh, new information that's come to light. You can appeal that decision. Uh, the local authority decides not to take over an IDP from a school. Again, appealable. Uh, a decision to cease to maintain the IDP by the local authority um, or a further education institution, that's um, appealable. Um, and then the contents of these sections, which I've listed, and it is effectively largely as before um you know the special educational needs uh, sorry additional learning needs the additional learning provision um the the name of the placement there's also that in relation to to um, any provision in welsh um and um as i say so in terms of the time frames children young persons or parents can bring an appeal uh, it's eight weeks is, is the standard time frame to um from the date of the decision to bring an appeal. But if you decide to use the local authorities independent um, disagreement resolution services, which are available, and there's there's more information on that on the um, tribunal website, then you can extend the time to apply um, to the tribunal for a further eight weeks. So that's potentially 16 week time frame in total. Um, okay, and, and just, to, just to note as well, children can, um, bring their own appeals to tribunal if they have sufficient understanding, which is interesting. Um, and children who lack capacity can still bring an appeal in their own name, um, but they'd have a case friend to represent them um, and to take decisions on their behalf if they have a, a, a parent who's willing or able to bring the case to the tribunal. Uh, sorry, if they don't have a, a parent who's willing or able to bring the case to tri tribunal. Um, so that's interesting. And, and then the code deals with that as well. Um, and these are just some helpful um, websites and key websites so as i said there's the send to website for statement appeals there's a education tribunal wales website for idp appeals as i said contains the appeal forms and, and various guides um, that you may find helpful the welsh government announcements page this is where you get any announcements on um on updates to um, implementation and the act um, and you can actually filter it by education um and so that's that's often a good place to look to see what the most up-to-date position is I mean, i've just put contacts website there as well for you um, as that contains a lot of helpful information um and this was everything i had um i put there our new inquiries line at erwin mitchell in case anybody does require um assistance and also um you can inquire online um through our uh, online inquiry form um, and, and contact have a free helpline as well um, that um, I've put the details there um, and I've also put some other helpful links um, that, that you may want to follow. Um, I'm sure Kate will explain um, in a bit more detail how those those help um, and, and what you know what what they've got available for you. Um, but um, that was everything we have run over time and um, there was a bit of a technical glitch. Um, I don't mind uh, taking a couple of questions if, if if that's okay, Kate, or I can follow up by email, whatever works best, really. Yeah, um, if we can keep that screen up, please, Nicole, because it's got all the contact oh, yeah. details. Um, thank you so much, Bethany. There are quite a few questions in the chat. 
um, already. So it'd be good if we could perhaps go over some of those um, yeah. or if not, if we can answer them after the session. Um, and we've also put our survey, our contact survey link in the chat for feedback on today's session, if people wouldn't mind completing that. Um, after the session, um, Bethany, if you're able to respond to those questions, I can then share the question and answers with everybody yeah. who's attended um, mm -hmm. and, and send that by email. I realize we've had some hiccups with the link um, going to another webinar. So I do apologize profusely to everybody for that. Um, but we are recording the, the session um, and we will share that with everybody. Um, uh, and I will discuss further with Beth what else we can send on to you. Um, so Beth, are you able to, to look at the chat or do you want? Yeah, I've had a look. There are quite a few questions. So I think the best way to do it is if I go through them, as you said, and then um, I can do an email for you to send out to everyone. Would that be okay? Yeah, and I will send the, the, as I said to everybody, I will send the questions and responses to everybody. I'm going to stop the recording now, but not actually stop the session. Okay, but thank you, everybody.